Summer at Vintage is a really wonderful time when our, our pastors get to just share with our church what God is teaching us. We spend a lot of time uh, throughout the year in series where we journey through a book of the Bible together or through like tracing a theme or some singular topic. And we always learn a lot together. And in in the meantime, God is continuing to teach all of us in the places where we are, where we are opening up God's word, both you and us. And Summer with Vintage just sort of affords us an opportunity to not be bound, for about lack of a better word, by a, by a series. We just get to teach you what God's teaching us. And one of the things that God has been teaching me probably more than anything over the last year, a few years or so, is about prayer and teaching me how to pray. I went back in some of my, my journal entries over the last year, and several are, are marked. They begin with, Lord, teach me how to pray. Lord, I want to pray better. Lord, I, I want my prayer life to be richer. And it was just this desire that was growing in me, not because I, I didn't know how to pray. I mean, I grew up in church. I grew up, I knew the Lord's prayer. I, I knew it, we prayed before meal times. You know, we did the God is great, God is good. And then graduated on to just, you know, more spontaneous kind of prayer. And still, I, I just felt like God, I, I just feel like there's more because I know that God is this, this deep, well. And I just, I felt like there was more to be had. And so I just asked God to teach me how to pray. And in asking God to teach me how to pray, he most certainly did. And the funny thing is when I asked God to teach me how to pray, little did I know that even in that moment, he was teaching me how to pray. Because the only way that you get prayer wrong is by not doing it right? That's the only way. We can sit here and obsess and fret over, am I saying the right words? Am I praying for long enough? Am I asking the right things? Am I aligned with your will? And all of those are important things to think about. But the most important thing is that you're actually praying. And so as, you know, in kind of retrospect, it's kind of like, oh, you, you were actually answering my prayer that I was praying in that moment because I was turning to you in prayer. And so over the last year, and God, you know, teaching me how to pray, there has, has been things that has helped me in that time of turning to the Lord in prayer. And so I just want to share with you what God has been teaching me. And much of what God has been teaching me is rooted in Psalm 1. So if you want to open your Bibles, it's in the dead center. We'll be in a few places in Scripture today, but it would be fine. Like if you want to just leave your Bible open right there, you would be be happy to camp there for the day. So Psalm chapter one, verses one through three says, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now you might be thinking, Jasmine, I thought we were going to talk about prayer and this didn't say anything about prayer. This is about somebody who delights in God's word and doesn't do the things that sinners do. What does this have to do with prayer? And I didn't know either at first. I just, I loved it. I loved the, the whole, like, whatever he does prospers. I was like, okay, let me get on that. And then I sort of just backtracked my way into this has everything to do with prayer. So that verse two that says, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. I love that verse. I have learned so much by just leaning into and meditating on this verse. There's two words in here that I want you to know that will help you as we continue to go through our conversation today. Those two words are delight and meditate. 
So delight, there's some words that you get a picture in your mind, right? When I say delight, the picture that comes to mind is of a child. It's a child whose eyes light up because they got an ice cream from the ice cream truck outside. And they're like, oh, it's my favorite SpongeBob ice cream. And it's just this love. It's this longing. It's this desire. It's this enjoyment. That, that is delight. One of the definitions for delight. So the word in Hebrew uh, for delight is uh, hefetz. And it actually literally means to bend. And so when you think about something that you delight in, it's something that you bend toward. We say things like, he was bent on getting a Mustang. She was bent on going to that that particular college. It's something that you're drawn to and determined for. That is what delight is. Now, the word meditate in Hebrew, this is my favorite word in Hebrew, okay? And I'm going to say this in the most Hebrew way I can possibly say it, and then you're going to say it too, so pay attention, okay? So in Hebrew, the word there for meditate is chaga, okay? I'm going to say it one more time, and we're going to say it together. It's a safe space. Chaga, all right? Say it with me. Ready? Chaga, okay. So the word chaga in Hebrew is an onomatopoeia. Now, onomatopoeia, we have these words in English too, okay? Like uh, bark, that's the sound that a dog makes, or the word hoot or splash. All of those words are onomatopoeia. The word hiccup is an onomatopoeia. It sounds like the, the action of hiccuping, picking up, hiccup, hiccuping. And Haga is the same. So the word haga is the sound. You you should draw to mind the sound of a bear in Alaska that's caught a salmon and he brings it onto land and he leans over it and he hagas it. He devours it. He chews it. He takes every morsel. And there's this sound that's coming out of his mouth, right? It's that, okay? I know this, this audio is going to be phenomenal, okay? <laughs> but that's the sound of meditating on God's word. It is the sound of delight. It is the sound of enjoyment. It is the sound of, I am going to rip every last morsel off of this piece of whatever it is, and I'm going to chew it. I'm going to discern all of its flavors. I'm going to digest it, and its calories are going to empower me to go and do the things that I need to do. That is meditating. Now, A lot of times in our culture, when we think about the word meditate, we get in our minds a picture of maybe like somebody doing yoga and their legs are all like pretzel twisty and their eyes are closed and they're trying to empty their mind of all thought. Well, in the Hebrew sense, that's not meditating at all. In the Bible, when it talks about meditating, what it actually means is filling your mind with the mind of Christ. It's emptying your mind of yourself, of your own thoughts, and filling it with what Scripture says. It's filling with the ideas of God. It's taking the emptiness of our humanity and replacing it with the good abundance of God. So whenever you encounter that word meditate, I want you to think about that you are a a bear over that scripture and you're bringing it in and it's something that you're enjoying and, and taking every last piece of. Now, what does this have to do with prayer? Okay, we, we've talked about that what you, you know, delight and meditate. So whatever you delight in, whatever you long for, you're going to think about. You know that, right? If you long to get a good grade, you're going to think about all the things that you need to do to pass the test, right? But if it's something that you desire, something you long for, the more that you think about it, the more you long for it. And the more you long for it, the more you think about it. And it's the same way with God's word. And the thing is, is that what we have in our mind will affect the things that we pray. What you think about will direct 
what you speak about. That's true both for the people around you, right? What you, what's on your mind, that's what you're gonna talk about. It's also true for God. What you think about is also what you're going to talk to God about. And so as we move through today, this idea of meditating on scripture has been so instructive for me in the way that I pray. And one distinction that I wanna make before we move on is that, that God, he knows all of your thoughts. Okay, because sometimes we're like, well, I don't even, like, why even pray? Like, God already knows everything that I'm thinking, and God is going to do what God wants to do. So why should I pray? Well, God knowing your thoughts is not the same thing as God hearing your prayers. Okay? God knowing your thoughts is not the same thing as God hearing your prayers. You can imagine, you know, being in a room, having a conversation and knowing that your husband is in the next room and the walls are paper thin and he can hear everything that you're saying, but he's not butting in. He can just hear it. You have this conversation and then the conversation's over and you have one of two choices. You can just pretend like he didn't hear anything and just go on about it. Or I can turn to my husband and say, I know you heard all of that. Can we talk about it? Or maybe he might even peek in and say, hey, I heard what you guys were talking about. You want to talk about anything? It's the same way with God. Sometimes I think God's waiting for us to turn our thoughts to him in prayer. All these things that we're mulling over in our mind and turn to him and say, hey, God, I know that I know you know all of my thoughts. Will you help me unmuddle them? God, will you help me figure out what I'm supposed to do here? And sometimes he kind of taps you and he's like, hey, I know you've been real worried about this. You want to talk to me about this? And he opens up that invitation for us to talk to God. So prayer is simply taking our thoughts and turning them instead of inward, it's turning them outward and upward out to God, offering that invitation for him to be part of your life. That's what it is to be in a relationship with God. And so this idea of meditating on scripture, of delighting in it, of longing for it, of knowing what God's word says, has opened up one of the most powerful ways that we have of communicating with God, and that is to pray scripture. This idea of praying scripture is one that has shifted the way that I pray. Now, praying scripture means that we're praying God's word. We're praying his word back to him. And I want you to think about the way that you learned to speak. I want you to think about the way that as a child, you learned to talk. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, My husband, Lyle, and I, we have three amazing, adorable, very chatty kids. No shock here. And we love to hear them talk. And one of the coolest things is when they're babies, they go through, you know, the the phase where all they can do is cry. They, They cry to tell you what's going on. They cry to tell you they're hungry and they cry to tell you they're uncomfortable and they they cry to tell you that they don't want to be sleeping. All of my babies cried like that. And, but then one day they find their voice. And you know what I mean? If you've ever heard a baby, they, they now can control like how loud they are and how quiet they are. They, they find that they can change pitch and that they can change frequency. Sometimes their sounds are really, really rapid fire and sometimes they're slow and long. And sometimes they talk back to you in like the same tone that you just talked to them and you're like, I just heard my tone in your little baby voice. And it's just a delight to watch them grow in the way that they talk. And you look them in the eye and, and you start to teach them words. And you say things like, mama, dada. You say things like, window, fan, blue, tar heel. You teach them all the important words. <laughs> Amen, right? And then one day, after all that they've taken in, you look at them and say, okay, say mama, say mama. And that child looks you dead in the face and says, dada. 
Yeah, every single one, amen, right? And it's a delight. We learn to speak by repeating back the words of our parents. And it's the same way with God. We learn to speak to God by repeating back the words of our Father. He has given us the words to use to speak to Him. And now just like we don't want our kids to forever and only parrot and repeat our words back to us, what we want is to impart to them a vocabulary and a set of values that they will use to speak to us because they long to be in a relationship with us because they just enjoy being around mom and dad. And it's the same way with God. We want to speak with our Father and He's given us this language of Scripture to use, this language of promises, this language of truth, this language of of promise that He has been providing and that He has been speaking, that He will continue to do that. Speaking prayer or praying scripture back to God is so powerful and because it is what God has, has given it to us. It never returns void. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says, for just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. God told the prophet Jeremiah that he watches over his word to accomplish it. God is attentive to his word. This idea was really rooted in me back in January when I heard someone quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer in this tiny little book that he wrote called Psalms. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, the richness of the word of God ought to determine our prayer, not the poverty of our heart. The richness of God, the richness of the word of God ought to determine our prayer, not the poverty of my heart. Not that God does not or cannot hear us when we pray out of the emptiness, but we are so much better able to communicate with Him. There's something solid to stand on when we're speaking out of the richness of His Word. When we speak out of God's Word, that's when we're praying out of authority and that's when we're praying out of power, not to manipulate God, but to invite God to remember what he said. That is so powerful. So what does it look like? What does it look like to pray scripture? Well, I just call it borrowing prayers. Just like we borrow the lyrics of songs to sing, like we don't just come in here and say, hey, everybody just Pick a tune and sing your own words. We give you lyrics. We give you songs to sing, right? Well, there's plenty of prayer in Scripture to pray. You can, you can pray. Uh, Paul, he often prays for the churches that he writes to. I borrow those. Sometimes I'll borrow the, the prayers of kings, of, of Solomon, of David. Sometimes I borrow the prayer of prophets or saints. I pray the truth of scripture. I declare and proclaim it in the face of lies or in standing on the promises or even just what I desire. One thing that I pray like over our kids, I pray Luke 2.52, which is where uh, Luke records Jesus as growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. I pray that over our kids. I want our kids to grow in wisdom. I want them to grow in stature and be taller than me. I want them to grow in favor with God and with man. That's what I desire. And so I pray that scripture over my kids. I pray the Psalms. St. Athanasius, he was a, a church father in like the fourth century. And he said that most of scripture speaks to us, but the Psalms speak for us. 
Even Jesus prayed the words of the Psalms. He prayed the words from the Psalms from the cross. When he prays, into your hands I entrust my spirit, that's Psalm 31 verse five. When he prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's praying Psalm 22 verse one. And not only is he praying Psalm 22 verse one, but when he prays that and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he's doing is he's calling up the entirety of Psalm 22 because in the Jewish culture, when they memorized Psalms, they didn't have like numbers. It wasn't like, oh, here's Psalm 22. It was actually called by the first line of the Psalm, which was, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And so everybody within earshot, when he prays that from the cross, they start thinking back through that entire Psalm that they would have memorized as kids. So they would not only have heard verse one, but in Jesus praying scripture, they would also have heard the end of that Psalm. Listen to how amazing this is. This is Psalm 22, verse 27 through 31. It says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. All who prosper on earth will eat and bow down. All those who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Even the one who cannot preserve his life, their descendants will serve him, that man on the cross. The next generation will be told about the Lord. They will come and declare his righteousness. When we come before the Lord, we're not declaring our own righteousness, but the righteousness of God that comes through Jesus and his blood that was shed on the cross. They will come to declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born. They will declare what he has done. Jesus prayed scripture in the most trying and suffering moments of his life. How much more should we know and long for and meditate on those scriptures so that we can pray those when we come up against those times in our lives? The way that Jesus prayed struck his disciples as so unusual that they ask him to teach them how to pray. They knew how to pray. They had been going to temple and synagogue since they were tinies. But there was something about the way Jesus prayed that made them think, we're missing something. And so they ask him to teach them how to pray. And it's recorded in both Matthew and in Luke. And the way that Matthew records it is like this. Jesus says, when you are praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him. Pray then in this way. Our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach him, to teach them how to pray, he prays. He teaches them to pray by praying. And in this prayer, he invites them to remember who God is, his holiness, to ask for God's will, to bring your needs before God, to ask God to deliver you from the trials and temptations of this world. Jesus gave us the words to pray and us praying scripture will help to guide our words and give us something solid to stand on when we turn to the Lord in prayer. Meditating and delighting on God's word 
allows us to pray scripture, but it also teaches us to pray with a sober mind. Peter puts it like this in 1 Peter 4, 7. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Now, before we get like chicken little and the sky is falling and the end is near, pray, pray, pray. Let me, let's go back to verse one of this and see like, what does he mean when he's talking about the end is near and we should pray? So let's go back to verse one. He says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, like the same understanding of Christ, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. And they're surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. Recall Psalm 1.1. They, they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, don't get caught up on this verse, but I'm going to read it anyway. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. He's saying all of these people are caught up living their one life in all of these wild ways. You need to get caught up in living your one life in the wild ways of Jesus. You need to be alert and aware of what is going on so that you can pray. Now, he says sober-minded. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, I don't, I don't like do drugs. I don't, I don't drink. I don't drink a lot. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sober minded. Well, let me tell you about my first binge experience. I was a senior in college, and I had a new a new roommate. I didn't really know her, and one day she brings in the most delicious six pack of DVDs that I could remember. Now you might be like, wait, DVDs, Jasmine, what are we talking about here? She brought in the boxed set of DVDs for season one of the OC, okay? Now for me as a senior in college, I just experienced the loss of my friends from friends that had ended the semester before. I boohooed my eyes out when Rachel got off the plane. Sorry, spoiler alert, it's been like 15, 20 years, you're fine. And I was like, I don't don't have where, my people are gone. I don't, what are are Ross and Rachel doing? What are are Monica and Chandler and Joe and Phoebe? What are they doing? Well, then lo and behold, she walks in, with a new season, a new series, ready to binge. It was the first time that I'd ever experienced that euphoria of watch next episode, watch next episode. And it just like kept playing. I didn't have to wait till next Thursday to watch the next episode. And I couldn't wait. I mean, I'd go to class and I'd be like, okay, is everybody gonna be back in the apartment? Let's watch the next episode. Do we have time? Yeah, we're gonna skip lunch. Homework, who cares? We can just watch the OC. It's gonna be fantastic. And when that season ended, it was like, well, where are my friends? I wanna know like, what's gonna happen. What happens with Ryan and Marissa? Are Seth and Summer ever gonna get together? And we do this, right? And what do we call it? We call it a a binge, right? We say things like we're addicted to social media, that we're obsessed with some influencer, that that we think about these things. We 
We may be sober of body, but we are not a people marked by being sober of mind. We are so caught up. I mean, gosh, YouTube, man, it's just gonna give you one video after another, after another of all the things that you love, right? And you can just go on and on and on and that scroll will never, actually never stop. And Peter says, be alert. Be sober-minded for prayer. And you might be thinking like, okay, so Jasmine, are you telling me I can't watch my show anymore? Are you telling me I need to delete all my social media accounts? Are you telling me I should not watch the news anymore? No, I'm not telling you that. But here's what I am telling you. One, yes, you do need to know what's going on in the world. Nowhere in scripture does it say that we need to bury our heads in the sand and just wait for Jesus to come back. However, what you have in scripture is the tools that you need to navigate all of the things that you will face when you watch those shows, when you hear that news clip, when you hear about the destruction of whatever's happening in some other foreign country, the words of scripture will give you what you need to combat it what you need to face it. When Paul talks about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter six, he says, put on the whole armor of God so that you are ready to fight the schemes of the devil. And in that whole list of things that he says that your armor, you've got a helmet, you've got a belt, you've got a breastplate and you've got shoes and you've got a shield, but you have one weapon. Do you know what that one weapon is? It is the sword of the spirit. I don't know how to hold a sword. It is the sword of the spirit that is the word of God. That is your weapon. So you need to know your enemy, yes, but you need to know your armor better. You need to know how to, when, when you're facing that temptation, when you're facing that thing, when you're trying to discern like which candidate should I vote for, it's not the political commentary that's going to be your guide. It is the word of God. And we need to spend time in there staying sober-minded and alert for prayer. And so if our mind shouldn't be flooded with all of these things, what should we be thinking about? Well, Paul tells us in Philippians Philippians chapter four, he says, this is what you need to be thinking about. He starts in verse six by saying, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. That's what we need to be thinking about. And I wonder if as Peter wrote those words to be alert and sober-minded for prayer, I wonder if he remembered being in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. You see, Jesus was getting ready to be arrested and he knew it. And so he goes into the garden to pray and he tells his disciples, stay here and pray. And then Jesus goes over and he begins to pray. And then when he comes back, he finds his disciples, Peter being one of them, asleep. And he says this, he says, stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I wonder if Peter looks back on that moment with some level of regret of, Lord, if I knew what was coming, if I knew what was going to happen next, I would have prayed. I would have stayed alert. 
And now he tells us here, that same Peter, stay awake, be alert, be sober-minded to pray. Don't fall asleep to your life. Don't numb yourself out and try to escape what's going on. Stay present, stay awake, pray. Not only does meditating on scripture allow you to pray scripture and be sober-minded, but knowing and delighting in God's word also allows us to pray without ceasing. I believe that Paul actually means what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, when he says, rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see, when we're in God's Word and we're delighting in it, and we're longing for it, and we're haggaiing it, we will never run out of things to talk about with God. We will continue to know better who He is and what He desires and what He promises. We will be more able to sit still and know that He is God because we know Him. It reminds us that He is the Lord of over all creation. And so when we see a sunset or we watch the leaves turn all the colors this fall, we stand in awe and we turn our hearts to Him and we say, thank you, God. We do it in these spontaneous moments, but maybe we need to do it in these fixed moments also. Maybe you need to set aside time to pray. Maybe you're relying too much on the spontaneity of prayer and you forget. Maybe you need to set an alarm and wake up and pray in the morning or set alarm midday and say, this is the time I'm gonna pray for my neighborhood. This is the time I'm gonna pray for our community. This is the time that I'm gonna pray for our world. It's putting a note by your bed that says, do not let sleep come to your eyes until you let God's presence dwell in you to find rest in you as you find rest in Him by giving thanks for the way that He brought you through the day. Will you bow your heads for just a minute? Let's close our eyes. I just I wanna ask you some questions and I'm asking you to close your eyes because I just don't want you to be distracted. I want you to imagine your thoughts as a pie, like a pie chart. And I want you to see all of the slices. What are your thoughts given to? Are your thoughts given to wondering about the characters in your favorite novel series or TV show? Are your thoughts surrounding worries about your kids, your finances, your job, your relationships? Are your thoughts about your fantasy football league or what you wanna do to improve your house? Some of these thoughts are not bad thoughts, but none of these thoughts can withstand the weight of you thinking about them every night and every day. But meditating on God's word can withstand the weight of your thoughts. It will withstand and prove trustworthy. So what do you think about? What are you longing for? What do you desire? Where do you need to grow in your relationship with God through prayer? Do you need to start out learning Scripture more so that you can pray the promises of Scripture? Do you need to be more sober-minded for prayer? Do you need to remind yourself to pray throughout the day? Maybe you've never prayed. Maybe praying to a God that you cannot see or touch or feel or hear feels weird. When you're in 
the delivery room and waiting on that baby, there's one sound that everyone is wanting to hear. And that is that first cry of a baby. And sometimes I think that first sound that we utter to God is a cry. It's, Abba, Father, I need you. Save me, help me, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we can go to God at any time with anything because through the faithfulness of Jesus and through His death on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom that separated mankind from the presence of God. And so we can enter into His presence in humility, but with boldness and with confidence that He hears our prayer. My desire is that we would be a praying church, but we will not be a praying church until we become people who pray. So as we sing this last song, I invite you to pray. Maybe you're going to pray the words of this song. Maybe you wanna sit there and open your Bible and pray the Psalms. Maybe you wanna come and you wanna kneel at the altar as a mark that from here out, the way that you pray will be different. The way that you pray will be more regular. The way that you pray will be with expectation. Maybe you need to be quiet. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God that hears us. Thank you for being a God that wants to hear from us. And so God, I pray that as we sing and as we worship and as we remember that you are in control, God, even when we're in comfortable, uncomfortable situations, God, that Overall, we want your kingdom to come, your will to be done. And so we want to know you and we want to know you in prayer. God, use this time, fill this time as you will. In your name I pray, amen.